Hey there, Ryan Kingsline here. Did you hear? What is going on? What is Epic doing? I think they're gonna rule the 3D world. I had a meeting with them once and they said something. I didn't quite believe it. I thought maybe it was a little bit, you know, big for their britches. I think I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the idiot in this game. So to honor this, to honor Epic acquiring reality capture, capturingreality.com, I'm gonna release right now the very first lesson that we have from Vlad, who works in AAA game studios, has done all of this work, does it for, uh, for environments in games. I don't know how long I'm gonna be able to keep this up. This is going to be, you know, a complete, almost a complete pipeline. You're gonna see Vlad go through the entire process except for bringing in to Unreal Engine. He's gonna use uh, Reality Capture, he's gonna use Maya, he's gonna use Photoshop, he's gonna use Substance Designer. Like and subscribe. Now, check it out. Hi everyone, and welcome to the first class of this workshop. We're going to get right into things, but uh, first I'll introduce myself. My name is Vlad, I've been working in the game industry for over 9 years, and I'm currently a senior environment artist at Arrowhead, working on an unannounced next-gen title. Um, I've worked on a number of AAA titles over the years, like Watch Dogs, Ghost Recon Wildlands, and The Walking Dead. I've always loved exploring worlds in video games, which definitely contributed to my decision of working as an environment artist. Um, I enjoy everything about creating these worlds, from modeling, materials, vegetation, all the way to the final level art and lighting. Video games are becoming increasingly detailed and getting closer and closer to photorealism, which is why I've decided to create this workshop on photogrammetry. Scanning, as it's also known, um, can help us achieve unparalleled realism in a fraction of the time it would normally take to create such polished assets. It's quickly becoming an industry standard at all the game studios, um, especially since Quixel has made it even easier to get access to a massive library of highly detailed assets. In this workshop, we will go over everything you need to know to start scanning your own assets, um, how to use those scans in a game development pipeline, and finally, build our own level inside of Unreal Engine using a modular workflow. Now it's time to jump into Reality Capture to see some examples and, and see how each type of surface um, uh, is captured. It will be a lot easier to get an idea of what works when we look at some examples, so let's jump straight in. So here you can see a surface that I've already captured and we will be, uh, we'll be processing this one a bit later as well during, the, um, during this lesson. But for now, what I want you to look at is the way that this has been captured. So I've briefly mentioned this when I was talking about the camera settings, um, but basically how you want to capture a surface. So this is one type of surface. It's in the case unique, so we won't make this one tileable. Um, but the same thing goes for any type of tileable material that you want to create. So let's say that this is, for example, a cobblestone material. Uh, what you can see is that for um, each of these photos, they overlap by at least 50%. And for you to be able to see this better, let me just enlarge this um, the cameras. So you can see how all these photos are overlapping each other by quite a lot. And they're also, um, they're also taken in this sort of um, linear pattern. Uh, it's sort of like a matrix. Uh, the best way to approach this is to just basically choose whichever surface you want to scan. Point your camera straight at it, uh, as straight as you can. Some angle is fine, uh, don't worry about it too much. Um, Reality Capture is very good at um, processing that. Um, but what you want to do is basically take a picture, move one step over, take another photo, move one step over, and just repeat the process all over again, while making sure that you are covering each of the previous photo by at least 50%. So that applies to when you go down in this matrix as well. So you get this little row, that's one step between each approximately, and then you go down one step and then do the whole process like that, and so on. So this will pretty much cover the whole surface. Um, and as you can see here, the, the result is very good. Um, it has captured all of the possible details that we want in here. Uh, let me see if I can get to the solid. Okay, it's not enough video memory, unfortunately. Um, we'll, uh, we'll go over this in a bit more detail uh, very soon. 
um, and you'll see how much detail uh, Reality Capture actually creates. It's um, it's really quite amazing. Um, so now uh, I think we've covered the surface, and we will definitely cover them in a bit more detail when we get to that specific lesson. Um, but let's take a look at how to capture a 3D object as well. So this is a very good example of a 3D object that you might want to scan. Um, in this example, it's a tree trunk. It's the lower part of that tree trunk. Um, this is actually starting to become used quite often in video games where you have the, um, the lower part of the, uh, of the tree trunk scanned because you get all of these very realistic details. Um, looks really good. It's at player height, so they'll always be noticed. Uh, and they're usually very, very hard to um, to get right through traditional techniques. And this is why um, this works so, so well. Um, it's also uh, an example of a 3D object that you will definitely have to scan during this workshop. Um, so let's take a look at how this one was actually captured, because I think it's very important to keep in mind how to actually go about scanning these sort of things. Um, usually what I like to do, uh, the first, so th this is the first step when starting to capture a 3D object. Um, you can see this, this uh, outer circle of photos that have been taken in the same pattern that we mentioned. So, you know, one step each, you take a photo. Uh, what this big circle does, and we can look through the photos here, I have taken basically what is a general view where I, um, where I have the whole, um, the whole object in my camera's view. And that's because having this general walk around the object um, gives reality capture uh, a very solid base from which to start on. So for it, so what I mean is I have taken this circle here that encompasses the whole, the whole object, the whole tree trunk in this case, as you can see. And then I have gotten closer to the object and taken a lot more photos just so we can get even more detail in these areas. And that's why you see there's, um, there's a certain number of circles here. So you can see these, uh, these cameras are pointed toward the base of the trunk where there's a lot of detail. Um, and what this does is it helps reality capture put it into context. So this outer circle um, describes the whole object, but if you just take that one, it won't be very detailed. However, when you take these close-up shots, also going around in a circle, as I've mentioned, uh, Reality Capture will be able to map all of these um, details to the outer circle. Um, you'll get a better idea, I think, when you start scanning by yourself. Um, but this is, a, this is a good way to go about it. So you don't have to do just one circle. It's good to have this general rotation around it and then go in to get um, close-up details of it. This one, for example, goes very close to the to the tree bark. Let me see if I can select a camera that shows it better. So as you can see, almost this this tree fills up almost the whole the whole frame of the photo. And if we zoom in, there's a lot of a lot of detail that Reality Capture will um, will be able to match, and you'll get a highly detailed uh, high high resolution mesh. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind. These sort of areas are usually quite tricky uh, when scanning. So you need to do a round of these also going around in a, in this case, in a semicircle. Uh, so Reality Capture has more information for this particular area. Um, and this goes for everything that you would like to scan. So if there's an area that usually has a lot more detail, you it's it's a very good uh, practice to just go over detail over that detail in either a circle or a semicircle. It depends on what you capture for that. And Reality Capture will be able to match all of these photos at once, which will give you the highest uh, detail possible that you can uh, that you can get out of it. Um, also, another thing to that I want you to keep in mind. Um, you should capture these from various angles and heights. Uh, you can see there's not a massive difference here, um, but it's usually a good idea, for example, to take another circle even higher if you want. For example, in this case, I was mostly interested in this base. But this is why I haven't had another circle going around it that's from a higher angle. Uh, 
but if you want to capture more of this it's good it's a good idea to take even another circle because this will give reality capture even more detail to to work with and it will be able to match everything to all the other photos um right so i think this is um this is a good overview of what you need to keep in mind when scanning again this will become a lot easier once you get a bit of um once you get a bit of practice yourself so i highly recommend going out and just scanning just doing some test scans for now just so you can get a get a feel for how photogrammetry works how reality capture handles these pictures how to edit them etc um and then you'll get a lot more comfortable um capturing your own assets um so i did mention that we are going to look at how to actually finalize uh two assets in this lesson so i think we can just jump straight into that right now um the first asset that we will be um, processing will be the um, the manhole that i showed you earlier in the video and we'll take it all the way from the raw photos that i've captured that are straight out of the camera we'll process them so that uh, reality capture can get the most out of those photos um, bring them into reality capture go over the whole process export the meshes that we need um, bake out the the material that we need and then finish out the whole material in substance designer after that we will go over a 3d object um, because that one requires a bit of a different workflow so we'll explore that as well and you can after that you should have a good enough base to start capturing your own um, your own scans all right so we are now ready to start actually processing the raw photos from from our camera um before we go into actually processing them a very important thing that uh, you should keep in mind is how to organize all of your scans this is very important because um, scanning can create a lot of data you'll have a lot of photos one um, you'll have a set of photos in raw then another set of photos in jpeg or tga or tiff whatever you decide to save it as uh, you'll have the actual scan you'll have that's the reality capture file uh, which also creates another folder you will have the exported meshes both the high poly and the low poly and you will also have the baked textures so this can get very messy very fast if you don't keep it organized um, and you need to keep this in mind as well because you'll you'll have to do this as well if you when you when you work in a triple a company uh, you will have to keep this organized as well because it's very important as someone else might have to take that scan from you and process it or um, you might not be able to make it to work for a certain week etc so it's very important to get used to keeping things organized uh, starting right now um, i will show you the way that i do it um, it's definitely not perfect but uh, it will help you stay organized at least so the way that i do is because um, you can take multiple scans for example and combine them into a single into a single material so because of that i what i usually do is i just keep the actual raw files relating to the scan into a single folder so in this um in this case i've put it on the desktop just for ease of use um, i usually have a photogrammetry folder on my hard drive um where you would find this folder so i called it decal underscore manhole underscore 01 that's because it helps me to know what it will be in the end so a decal if it's a material i would call it material or mat um what it is obviously manhole and all one just because i'm uh, i might scan different types of manholes which is something that you will most likely end up doing so in this folder i have the raw folder this is where i keep the raw photos that are straight out of the camera and i seem to have uh, two raw folders all right uh, so this is where i have with this is where i keep the raw photos related to that scan and we can look at a bit of the photos you can see they're they're nothing special in the sense that they're just photos going around in that pattern that i've shown you earlier um but it's using the settings uh, some of the settings that i have mentioned um 
So as you can see, it's nothing special. This will not be a difficult part. You just need to keep in mind all of those settings. And with a little bit of practice, you will definitely get the hang of it quite quickly. Now, the first thing that we need to do with these is just edit them in Photoshop. Um, so Photoshop has a very good raw file editor. And it can um, edit all of these photos at once. All you need to do is just select all of them and drag all of them into Photoshop. So it takes a while to open depending on how many photos you have and you can see you have this is the uh, the camera raw editor in photoshop um, and you can see you have the film strip here where all of your photos are put in a film strip basically so for you to edit all of them you just need to select all of them and all of the all of the settings that you do here will apply to all of the photos a good thing to keep in mind is to first select the photo where you have this um, the color checker um, because that will be the one where you will be seeing the uh, the edits first uh, and we need this just so we can select the, the color balance so let's select all of them and now let's try the exposure for example and you can see in the film strip it gets updated so all of these settings are applied to all of our files let's set this one down back to zero so as I mentioned, I usually, um, I usually capture my photos at minus 0 0.5 exposure. That's because it gives me the best balance of the settings that I've mentioned. So let's increase this to 0 0.5. Um, this for me right now is not enough exposure, um, but we will come back to this later. The, um, this is the most, uh, the most important part and the one that we will be using uh, for most of this uh, of this workshop um, it it uh, contains all of the important settings that we need to do so the first one here at the top is the white balance and this is why I mentioned that it's very important to capture it in raw files because you can now change the white balance after you have taken the picture the raw file is just the raw information from your camera sensor that means you can adjust whatever you want to a certain degree, of course, after you've already taken the picture. So we have auto, um, we can change it to daylight, which gives us a very bluish tint, cloudy, shade, tungsten, and all the others. Now we can keep it as shot. So it takes all the, uh, all the settings that we had in our camera at the time. And this is the white balance tool. What it does is it samples what, um, samples the white in your scene and adjusts all of the other colors accordingly so because we have this color checker or in your case like i've mentioned you can have a white piece of paper or cardboard uh, we can just click on this and then select this which is pure white and you can see it has adjusted all of the other colors automatically and it's super fast and accurate we don't have to worry about these settings at all um, Okay, so we have set the exposure to plus 0 0.5 to compensate for the way I captured them. Um, the contrast, we will not really touch. Um, we don't want to play around with that. The settings that we will definitely touch are the shadows. So the shadows is quite uh, self-explanatory. It just uh, increases the brightness of the shadow. So for example, if you go all the way up, um, it hasn't detected a lot of shadows here, but it's good to always um, set it as high as you can. If you go to minus, you can see it has already darkened the areas where you would normally get ambient occlusion. So let's keep it as max at maximum. Um, the highlights does the same thing as shadows does, but for the highlights. So you can see if I lower it, uh, all of these um, white highlights in the stones will go a bit darker. If I raise it, um, it will make them a lot brighter. Usually I don't really like going all the way to minus 100 with highlights. And that's because in certain cases, and again, you will need to experiment yourself. What it can do is it can um, just completely obliterate the highlights. And you want some, um, some contrast between the various elements of the picture. So usually a good value that I keep it at is minus 50. This is subject to change according to the photo, so don't be afraid to experiment and just choose what looks good. Um, 
now we have these two settings, the whites and the blacks. So the whites does something similar to the highlights, but it goes for the whole white range. So you see it's very similar, but it can blow out your picture. So be careful with this setting. Um, I usually don't always set this one. Um, in this case, I don't think I want to set it for more than minus 20. Um, and the other one is actually a very useful one. So it brings out, it brings up all of the blacks in the, in the photo. So let's test that out. As you can see, it washes out the photo completely. Um, you need to experiment again with the setting as well. Um, in this case, I think bringing out the blacks to the maximum just washes out the stones as well, which I don't want. Um, so it's probably good to keep it at somewhere around plus 50. Um, so keep in mind that in the photos that we have captured, we have already ambient occlusion in the image. And we will delight that one by baking the ambient occlusion layer. So don't always take the photo as you see um, as being um, almost final. We will do some editing later. So in this case, um, these occluded areas might look delighted if I crank it up all the way to 100, but we're losing a lot of detail in other areas, which, which we don't want. Let's keep it to around maybe, maybe something like this. Um, we will not touch any of the other settings. There's a lot of it, uh, a lot of settings here in the camera raw editor, but we don't need to touch any of these. Um, we just want the photos to be prepared for scanning. So don't touch any of these. And especially there's, um, if you go to, I think it's the optics tab, you can use profile corrections. Um, so what this does is um, it has profiles for various types of DSLR, cam DSLR cameras, even for phones. Um, and it automatically adjusts the curvature that's uh, inherent in each camera and makes the, does some geometric um, modifications to your image. Let's actually just set this one. And you can see it already does some edits. It removes vignetting. It removes some of the uh, camera distortion. You can see it more towards the corners. Um, you don't need to do this. I know it can seem like it's doing a very good job, but camera um, reality capture already has this built in and it will actually give you better results if you don't do this in Photoshop after the fact. So don't, uh, we don't need to look at this one. Um, this is where all of our important, all of our important settings are. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much it in terms of, uh, in terms of the, uh, the actual processing of the photos. One thing I want to come back to, as I've mentioned, I'm not really happy with this exposure. So let's take this uh, toggle sampler overlay uh, and let's put it onto this white checker. Uh, so this gives us the RGB values of that uh, particular sample in, in, uh, in the photo. Um, as you can see, the values are very close, which, which is good. It means it's calibrated. Um, but I wanted to get it closer to um, better value in terms of the RGB values. Um, we won't be able to get it to pure white, and that's because we've already messed with the highlights and the whites. So if you take the exposure all the way up until this reaches 255, which would be pure white, you can see everything is already completely blown out. Um, a good range that I found that works for most, uh, the most photos that I've taken is usually between 200 and 220. Um, you can experiment and see what looks best. In this case, I think maybe going around somewhere like this will give us a good result. And yeah, this is perfectly fine. And you saw it was around uh, the 12, I believe. Yeah. Um, so it's somewhere close to the middle of the image. Let's try going maybe a bit. Yeah, one is enough. You don't want to have overblown details in your uh, in your image. As you can see, it gets very close to the top. So that's as far as we, we will go. Maybe actually lower it even a bit. Um, all right. So let's save our images. You can press this button here, which looks kind of like a download button, I guess. Um, select your folder. In this case, we'll just go to the 
decal command fold. And I'll create a different folder where we will, where we will save our edited images. I'll just call it JPEG uh, because this is the format that I will be using. You can choose to save them in a higher quality format like uh, uh, TIFF, TIFF. Um, I've done that, but personally, I haven't seen significant improvements in the image quality. So I usually just save it as JPEG. It, uh, it's faster and uh, saves a bunch of uh, disk space as well. So I'll go with this. You can choose your extension here. So file extension, format, and I usually set the quality to the maximum. So 12. And now we can just save the photos. Take a bit of time. So I will pause the video and come back to you. All right, so Photoshop has finished saving the, uh, the edited files and we can go into the folder where we saved them, see how they look. You can see there's a massive difference between this edited file, if we just look at it, and the raw file that we got from our camera. But there's almost no loss in quality. So this is why the raw, the raw format is so powerful and why I highly recommend it. Um, you have the option to, so for example, if you decide to use your phone, uh, you have the option to save photos from your phone in the raw file. However, because the sensor in a phone is of much lower quality than um, a sensor in a DSLR camera, um, you won't get as much range as you can get with these, uh, with these files. So keep that in mind. Um, okay, so let's go back to our JPEG folder. Everything so, seems to be fine. So now we can jump into Reality Capture. Um, let's bring the photos in. So you just drag, select all of them, drag and drop into this uh, Add Imagery tab here. And you can see Reality Capture has already brought the photos in. Uh, before we start calculating everything and going, well, I'll, I'll just go over a bit over the, the interface and the overall workflow that we're going to do with reality capture so the interface is relatively simple and you won't need to use everything out of it uh, i'll go over the navigation first um, simply because it's a bit weird in reality capture uh, you might be used to other modeling software uh, this one unfortunately though is a bit different so left click just pans the camera um, right click rotates and the middle mouse wheel zooms in and out um, it's a bit it's a bit weird uh, but you'll get used to it and we won't be spending too much time in here anyway so this is perfectly fine um, going over to the top so we have this layout that we chose um, you can choose if you don't see this layout you can choose it from here you can go to the layout Click on it, and I have this one selected. So one plus one plus one layout. Uh, what this does is gives us three um, three viewports. Let's call them. Uh, one is the all of the images that we brought in. This is where, where we can study each image in detail um, if we want to. We could use this for for manual control points, but uh, if we do the capture right, we won't really need to to use this. And this obviously is the 3D viewport where, uh, where we'll see our, uh, our scan. Um, so overall, the workflow in, um, in Reality Capture is we have to first align the images, which is done here. So you just align these, uh, the images and that will give you a very, um, um, a very low detail point cloud uh, just to allow you to do all of your um aligning and other stuff that you need to do uh, so you prepared for the actual uh 3d model processing which is this one uh you can see it's grayed out right now because we haven't aligned the images and it doesn't know what to process but we'll go over this soon um there's the simplify and we'll actually use this um before exporting what we'll be doing is we'll export uh a mid detail model that we'll use for retopologizing and then we'll need to simplify it with this uh, with this button, and then we'll export the final complete ultra high resolution three uh, D model as well. But we'll export it to a different file, and we'll use that one for baking. Um, the next button will be colorize. 
So colorize, what it does, it's sort of like poly, uh, poly paint a ZBrush, if you have used that. What it does is it assigns um, one color per, uh, per polygon or per vertex. Um, depending on how high resolution your model is, this could be perfectly usable. Um, however, I personally don't use this one. Um, it really is dependent on how detailed your mesh is. Um, and that can create some issues with some meshes in certain areas. Um, this is why I prefer using the texture option. This creates, it basically it automatically UV maps your high resolution mesh and then maps all of these photos onto, um, onto your high resolution mesh. That way you get a much higher detail even in, um, even if the mesh isn't very high resolution, the base color that you get is still very detailed. So this is why I prefer this option by far. Um, so if you go into alignment, uh, we have some options here as well. Uh, I won't be covering them into too much detail because uh, usually when you, when you would need to use these options are when your alignment has failed for whatever reason. Usually this is because you haven't, uh, you haven't taken your photos properly or because you've had to take several different sets of the same objects for various reasons. Let's like say you're scanning a very large, uh, uh, I don't know, I've seen castles being scanned, so you need to manually adjust some of those settings. But um, for what we're working with, we won't actually need this one very much. Um, the reconstruction tab uh, gives you a few more options. Um, what we'll need is mostly the, the mesh, which will export our mesh. Um, the simplify tool that I've mentioned already. Um, the smoothing tool, um, it tries to smooth out the high resolution mesh, but I don't think it does a very good job yet. So I don't usually use it. Also, it can, um, it can wash out some of the details in your high resolution mesh. So I prefer not to not to actually use this, uh, this option. Um, we do have, however, here two things that we'll be using quite often, and we'll go over them soon. So this is the reconstruction region. Uh, you will see what this does better uh, in, a few, in a few minutes. Uh, but basically, you define the region that you actually want to build a 3D model out of. Um, and we'll go over this very soon. And define the ground plane. We'll go over this very soon as well. Um, it basically allows you to uh, move the created point cloud into the 3D space, just so you can align it to the center of your world. Um, and the scene it just has some settings related to the actual scene, but since we don't have anything here right now, they won't do much. We can go over them for a bit, but usually I don't, uh, I don't spend too much time here. All right, so now we can actually start aligning our images. Um, and all you have to do is just click this button and it will start aligning. Um, this, uh, this phase of the, uh, of the process doesn't usually take too long. Um, it only takes a few seconds. All right. And this is the point cloud that I've been mentioning since, since the beginning. Um, as you can see, it's just a bunch of points that it has identified. Um, and it gives us, a, if you zoom out, it, it will almost give you the, the finished model. Um, this is very good for us to be able to just align everything. As you can see, it's the alignment is is very weird. So we can go on to aligning everything first, uh, and then we can start actually processing it into a into a 3D model. So for the alignment, we go back to this uh, reconstruction tab, and we click on define ground plane, and you will see this uh, this rotation gizmo has appeared here. So all you have to do is just align it basically to the actual actual ground um just wanted to mention that i usually prefer to do my alignment here rather than having to retopologize a mesh that is um extremely um out of alignment that is just placed weird around the world so it's good to invest a little bit of time here just to align it as well as you can rather than trying to um, retopologize your object that's in a that is in a very very weird position All right, so this one seems to be quite centered and click to get out of it. 
Now you have the set reconstruction region here. If you click the drop down arrow, you will see set region automatically. This will just automatically adjust this, um, this box, which is the region that will be actually be processed into a 3D model. And we'll set it automatically according to where the furthest calculated points are. So let's do this. And obviously looking at it, we don't really want uh, to process all of this because what we need is just this manhole and the, uh, the cobblestone surrounding it. So we can just adjust it like this. You just uh, click and drag on these uh, on these control points, and I usually like to give it a bit of uh, of a breathing room, just so we don't get in, into uh, any issues. So this should work fine, and this is usually a good time to save our project. So let's just call it decal underscore manhole one and i prefer to call this scan just so i know it's the scan file all right so now you can see everything is aligned quite well um it has already aligned the images and if we go back to the workflow tab uh you can see that now the calculate model is not grayed out anymore uh, before you click this though, uh, keep in mind that by default, it will do it in normal quality. Um, you can set what each quality means, but I wouldn't recommend really going into the settings because we'll usually use the high quality. Uh, but what the normal quality, so there's three quality types, preview quality. This is just going to calculate it as quickly as possible and it's usually very fast. Um, but it'll just give you a preview type of model. So you can see that all the images are indeed aligned correctly. Um, it's not meant for final production quality. Like it says in the name, it is just a preview. Uh, normal quality, what it does is it, um, process it processes it at, at a slightly lower quality than high quality. Um, the way it does that is it resizes the images by two. So divide the, the, the width and the height by two and uses those images to process it. Um, because of that, of course, you have less detail and you will have less detail in your, uh, in your final model. Um, you can try out, I usually what I do is I just try the normal quality first and see how it looks. Um, a lot of time, well, not a lot of times, but sometimes you will find out that the normal quality level is perfectly perfectly acceptable. Uh, it takes a lot less time to process, so you might just use that. Um, but in this case, we will go for the high quality. Um, this will be a material, so we want to have the the most detail that we can get out of it in in the cobblestone that's surrounding the manhole, in the manhole itself. We will even get the uh, the little dirt particles in the normal map, etc. So usually I advise you to use the high quality, even though it can get you a very high resolution mesh when you export it. Uh, it's usually it's usually however worth it. So let's do this right now. Um, high quality. Keep in mind it takes a very long time to process, uh, depending on on how powerful your PC is. So it can take anywhere from one to even eight or more hours. So I'll just click this one and we'll come back to it when it's already done uh, when it's already done uh, processing. All right, so as you can see, it has finished processing. Um, you see that we got gotten pretty much all of the detail that we got, including the detail in the actual dirt, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, so as you can see, um, when we process at high quality, sometimes we get uh, incredibly high resolution meshes. Uh, because of that, we can't really display it in um, <clears throat> shaded full 3D mode, and we just get this very dense point cloud. Um, this is fine. All we need to see is that we've actually managed to scan everything and we'll just use the very high resolution mesh to bake all of these uh, details onto a low resolution mesh. Um, there's just one step that we need to do before we can export this out and start baking uh, and that's actually texturing it. Um, and it's this texture button here that I've mentioned previously. So let's just click that one and let it texture. All right, 
So as you can see, we've done, uh, we've, uh, we finished processing the texture um, and the results are quite good. Uh, Reality Capture has really just processed everything that we need to get it ready for, uh, for baking. Um, we're going to export our mesh and the associated texture with it. Uh, but before we do that, let's go a bit into the reconstruction tab and look at the settings. So let's go here. And here you will find the settings for when we actually export our mesh. So if you click it and go into coloring texturing. Now there's one setting that I want you to look at, and that is the um, maximal texture resolution. Um, I like to set this at 16K. It's, um, it's very high, but it allows you to basically texture pretty much any object, um, uh, almost regardless of the resolution, onto one single UV texture, which is something that uh, we definitely want. So you have the options here to set it at any resolution that you want, but 16K um, works for the vast majority of cases that I've tried. So set it to that one. And now we are actually ready to export it. So just click this mesh button here in the reconstruction tab. Go into our folder. Um, I already have a file here that I've exported late, uh, earlier, but let's do it again. So let's call it decal, decal manhole 01 scan. Uh, I like to call it underscore ultra, uh, just because this lets me know that it's the highest resolution mesh that I can get out of, uh, out of reality capture. Uh, and set the, uh, the file format to FBX. Uh, it's the easiest to work with for now. So let's just do this. Um, so in this export uh, dialog, uh, you have at least one setting that you need to look at. So this is the uh, save mesh by parts. Um, set it to false. So sometimes what Reality Capture does is because it has maybe very high resolution meshes, it just um, divides them up into multiple parts. Uh, but for the export, we don't actually want this. You can get some errors sometimes. So just set it to false and it will work just fine. And in the texture settings, set your texture file format. I've set it to PNG. Um, and that's pretty much the only other uh, setting that you need to look at. And of course, uh, export texture set it to true because we wanted to export this, uh, the textures. So just click OK. Um, and this will take a bit of time as well, depending on, high, on how high resolution your mesh is. So I'll come back once it's done. So Reality Capture has finished exporting. We can see the result here. So we have the Ultra FBX file, uh, quite a large file. So always keep that in mind because photogrammetry you can um, take up quite a bit of space. Uh, and we have the associated color texture uh, that we've baked together with it. So let's actually take a look at it and see what it looks like. Uh, remember that it's in 16K, so it's quite a large file. Um, if you look at it, it's it's extremely messy. That's because the, uh, the UVing of the high poly mesh was done automatically, uh, but we don't. It doesn't really concern us in any way uh, because we'll bake all of this down to our properly mapped uh, low poly mesh. So uh, the way this one looks doesn't really matter as long as it uh, as long as it works on the uh, on the high poly mesh. Um, before we start baking, uh, we need to do one more step. And this is where, where we'll use the uh, simplify tool that I mentioned earlier. So let's go into this one. Um, the reason we're doing this is because I like to export um, a mid poly mesh. So it's basically a relatively high poly mesh. Um, I set it around 250,000 polygons. Uh, that gives me enough polygon resolution to be able to see all of the shapes that I need to retopologize, uh, but also makes it easy to work with in real time in Maya or any other tool that you're going to work with. So I prefer using this workflow rather than using the ultra high poly mesh, which can get to more than 200 million polygons. And it, in, some, in some pieces of software, that's pretty much impossible to work with. So if you go into the simplified tool, um, like I said, I usually set it to 250,000. Um, anything bef between 250,000 and 500,000 should be uh, easy to work with in any software. And another thing, uh, this is related to the, um, the setting that we had earlier, which is uh, preserve parts, and we want to set this to false. Uh, we don't want this to preserve any of the mesh parts that uh, Reality Capture might have created. Um, and then we can just click Simplify, 
and we'll have reality capture just basically decimate this uh, this mesh into a into a lower resolution. So we're now finished with the simplifying. Um, we can look, uh, we can see and see how it looks in uh, in three D because this should work just fine. It's uh, two hundred fifty thousand polygons. So, like I mentioned, you you get all of the details that you can possibly need for. Um, for apologizing, but you keep it at a very uh, manageable number of polygons. Um, so you can see it still preserves pretty much every detail that we need. So let's export this one as well. Click on mesh. And let's call it mid. So it knows the middle. Uh, it should preserve all the settings that we had before, so you don't really need to go over them again. Um, it doesn't export any texture because we haven't textured it yet and we don't really need that. So this is perfectly fine. So just click OK. And now if we go into our folder, you'll see we have the ultra and the mid, uh, the mid poly mesh. So now we're ready to take this into Maya and re-topologize it. So getting into Maya, which is where we'll be doing our, um, our retopologizing, uh, let's import the mid poly mesh that we saved earlier. So let's go to import. Go to desktop or wherever you have saved it and just double click. So this is something that uh, is very important to keep in mind because it can affect your, um, your baking layer on. Uh, when it imports a mesh exported from uh, from reality capture, it automatically sets the scale to 100, which is obviously too large, but it's also very important to remember that in the file itself, the scale is set to 1. So when you export your... Actually, okay, let's do this. Uh, let's set it to 1. So you can see this is the actual scale of the mesh that's in the file itself. Um, and this is the... Uh, the scale at which we'll be exporting our retopologized mesh as well. However, since, as you can see, it's very, very small, it's a bit hard to work with. So what I like to do is just set the scale to 10 and retopologize according to, according to this one. Uh, and just remember to adjust the scale accordingly for the final low poly mesh. Okay. So this will be a quick intro to how to actually retopologize something in Maya. Um, in this case, it's just going to be a simple plane because that's what we want to bake it onto. Uh, it'll just be a simple decal. Um, but uh, we're going to use some um, a bit of uh, a bit of the retopologizing tools that uh, that Maya has. So for the retopologizing to work in Maya, uh, you first have to set this high poly mesh. You have to set it as a live surface, and you have this magnet looking icon here and it says next to it no live surface if you click it you'll see that the mesh node that we exported here is set as a live surface and that means we can't select it anymore uh, but everything that we create will be will be adjusted will basically snap to the vertices of this mesh uh, during the topologizing so let's create the plane first and let's just adjust the uh, the scale of it to cover the whole manhole basically make it a bit bigger make it quite a bit bigger um, it's fine to cover a bit more area because we're only interested in this um, this row this this row of cobblestones surrounding the manhole will be the edge of our decal we'll paint the opacity layer in photoshop but for the baking it's fine if we just bake it on uh, if we just bake it on this uh, this mesh all right so like i said because it's a live it's a live surface now we might not actually need to do this <clears throat> but let's see Basically, when I move uh, vertex now, uh, it will snap to the surface, as you can see. So if you good, if we do this, you can see that it snaps to every vertices, uh, all the vertices here. Um, what I usually like to do is just kind of get, um, let's undo again. 
I usually like to get it into the cracks uh, between these cobblestones, just so I know I have um, the the lowest point in my height map is that one. Um, so we can try doing that right now, although it might be a bit hard because of the snapping, um, but it's fine. So we got it here. And this, you'll see, it doesn't really, won't actually reach it if we just put it down, but we'll edit this one later. Let's get this down as well. And the same for this one. All right. So now we can disable this uh, live surface thing just because we want to edit it without it actually snapping. Because you see here, it's not actually down to the grout. So let's get it down a bit lower so it intersects with the grout in between the cobblestones. We can do this here as well. Maybe we can lower it a bit. And we can do this for this one as well. Let's see how high it is. It's quite high. So just intersect it a bit with this one. Maybe even a bit lower. Okay. So this is our low poly mesh. Um, let's just freeze the transformation. I have a shortcut uh, here in my shelf. Uh, but if you want to access it, it's in the um, modify, reset, uh, Freeze transformations. So you can just click this one. But I put it here for convenience. All right. So um, another thing to keep in mind before we actually export this low poly mesh, and it's important to remember all of these steps, otherwise, you will get um, weird baking results because the uh, low poly mesh won't actually match the high poly mesh that you have in your file. We have to set the, um, the pivot point of this one to. The center of the world so to zero so it coincides with the the pivot point of of the high poly mesh so let's select this one again doesn't really matter what we call it so i'll just leave it at that and remember what i said about the scale so this one is right now at 10 scale the real scale however is one so what we need to do is to divide this by 10 so we'll have to set the scale to 0 0.1 and this is why it's important to set the pivot point the same as the high poly mesh, because when you scale it back down, it will still match perfectly with uh, with what was done before. So we can export this mesh now as our as our low poly mesh. Actually, before that, let's check the UVs. Let me just grab it from the other monitor. So there shouldn't be any issues with the UVs here, since it's just a simple plane. Um, but it's a good idea to check them anyway. So let's see. Yeah, this is perfectly fine. So we don't need to do anything to the UVs. So let's just export this. And yes, we have the proper folder. So let's just call this one low because it's our low poly mesh. These are the settings that I use here. You can just, uh, I just have this one, uh, the smoothing groups and the tangents and binormals checked. Everything else is unchecked. Again, FBX export, it needs to coincide with this. And just click export selection. And it should be done. All right. So now we have all of these three files, including the, and the extra texture that we've created. So we can go into actually making all of the maps that we need. Um, so we'll be doing all of our baking in X normal. Um, so the reason for that is um, normally for other types of assets, I would just use marble set or substance designer, etc. Uh, et um, the reason I use X normal is because um, it doesn't show you the high resolution mesh. And because some of these meshes that we're exporting from reality capture can get, like I said, into the hundreds of millions of polygons, um most uh most applications just can't can't handle that <clears throat> but uh, x normal actually works really well with that because like i said it doesn't actually display any of the meshes that we uh that we create so i'll i'll uh, i'll show you how to bake into in uh, in x normal as well it's a pretty old software so it has its kinks it obviously looks awful um but it still works really well. Um, and another reason why I'm using this one is because the ambient occlusion that it makes is physically accurate and uh, works really well for delighting. 
You know, he, you'll see here we have a few tabs to the right. Uh, let's go over it in order. So the first one is the high definition meshes tab. Should be quite self-explanatory. This is where we put uh, our high definition mesh. So let's just drag the ultra file that we just scanned. Well, we just exported. And it's already set here as a high resolution mesh. You don't need to change any of the other settings. But we do need to do something extra here. So where it says base texture to bake, this uh, this is where we'll input this texture here that we uh, that we exported from Reality Capture. So let's right click. You gotta right click here, click base texture to bake. And if we go to desktop, just select this one. Um, so now it knows. If we go back to the baking options, when we select when we select bake base texture. It will know where to bake it from. So we'll choose this one. Low definition meshes, again, quite self explanatory. So let's just drag the low here. Now there's a few settings, well, actually, just two for now that we'll need to look at is the maximum frontal ray distance and the maximum rear ray distance. Um, what this does is basically creates a cage. Um, we won't put in these numbers uh, manually. Uh, it has a tool for that, and we'll go over to it right now. It's called the Ray Distance Calculator. Uh, like I said, it's in the Tools tab. So what it does is just automatically calculates um, a cage for the low poly mesh to bake. Um, I haven't run into any issues for scans. It usually does a very good job of actually finding the edges, uh, well, creating an automatic cage, basically. Uh, and especially for these sort of situations where you just have a flat plane, it uh, it works perfectly. So let's just click this one and we get this little window. All you need to do is press go and then it will start actually reading the file, processing everything. Um, and then it will start actually determining what the edges of the high poly mesh are and then adjust the cage of the low poly mesh uh, accordingly. It can take quite a bit of time because our uh, our high resolution meshes are quite heavy, like I've mentioned. Um, but uh, usually, when you know it start it starts actually processing, is it will uh, it will display uh, in the bottom here after it finishes generating the nodes. It will display the number of seconds that it's actually been processing. So we can wait a bit. This one should go quite fast, and I'll show you what I mean. So now, as you can see, it says computing five seconds. Um, I usually stop at around 30 seconds, something like that. It, um, that's kind of when it seems to uh, settle down and it's finished uh, processing the whole, uh, all of the edges of the cage. So we can, uh, when it gets to 30 seconds, we can just press stop. All right. And we'll stop calculating that cage and we can just click copy results. You have to do this for these values, which correspond to the values that we looked at earlier in the low definition meshes. So I'll just copy them over in those uh, in those areas that I've showed you. So just click copy results, close this. And if you go back to the low definition meshes, you can see these, uh, these values here. And we have the cage now, so it's ready to bake. So in the baking options, first, let's just uh, select an output file. I like to create a folder named bake just so I know that that's where I have all of my bakes. And let's just call it decal underscore manhole underscore 01 underscore bake just so I know it's the bake files. And for the format, uh, use diff. And that's because we will be baking out the, uh, the height map as well. And we need that one to be in 16 bit for it to. Uh, to work properly in Substance Designer, that's the that's the quality that you want it to be at. And if we have the height map properly baked, we can create a normal map out of it. We can edit it in multiple ways, etc. So keep in mind to always save it as a save your bakes as a diff file. So just click save. All right. So now we have where it says size. Obviously, it's the size that you want to bake it at. Um, for this case. I'll set it at just 2K. We don't really need more than that, but you can set it at whatever you want. Just keep in mind that the higher you set it, uh, obviously the, the longer it will take. 
and the ambient occlusion baking can take quite a bit of time so um, try to save that time wherever you can um, so for baking we actually just need these first four maps so we need a normal map and be careful in the settings we need a directx normal map so by default the y is set to y plus set it to y minus and this will give us a normal map that's in um, directx format and also make sure to have tangent space checked otherwise we'll have a world space normal map which we don't check the height map um, the base texture there's not many options here really that we can use and check the ambient occlusion as well for the ambient occlusion um, i found that 128 rays uh, works best in terms of quality versus speed if you set it to much higher uh, it will take a lot longer to bake um, and the results won't they won't necessarily be much better they will definitely be better but for what we need it for, which is mostly for the lighting and using in a game engine, we don't really need to go too high. So 128 works fine. And you can leave the rest at the default. And the only other thing that we need to check is the anti-aliasing. Set it to the maximum, 4x. Um, the padding here selects the number of pixels for padding. Um, I usually leave it at 128. In this case, we won't have any padding because the whole bake will take up the whole um, the whole texture space so now we're actually ready to bake you just need to gen uh, click generate maps and then we can start actually baking and before um before i do this um when you when you generate the height map during the baking well actually actually after it finishes baking the height map you will get a pop-up dialog where you select the range of the height map um just uh click the sliders so you can get a nice range between the bottom of the bake and the top of the bake you'll see what i mean when you get to it um i can't really show it right now unfortunately because it takes a lot of resourcing power uh well computing power um but you will definitely know what i mean when the pop-up um appears so just edit those values and I will show you what the finished height map looks like so you know what to what you want to expect. Let's click just generate the maps and we can start baking. All right, so we're finally finished baking and we can take a look at the resulting maps. So this is the this is the base color that we baked and you can see there's no errors it baked perfectly fine. The uh, height map normal map and the ambient occlusion so we're going to bring all of these soon into substance designer but for now we still need two additional maps that we're going to use there one is a metalless map so well a metalless mask which will mask out all of the areas that are metal in our image and one will be an opacity map and we'll create both of these in photoshop so let's bring the base color into photoshop first Let's duplicate the layer. Uh, I just press Control J to duplicate it. Um, so now what we want to do is select everything that is metal. And throughout most of this image, this color seems to be the metal. So let's just let's just go to Select and Color Range. So I'm just clicking and dragging around until I find something that covers most of the metal areas, and this seems to work fine. You can go and change this fuzziness slider to something that feels right uh, you want something that's quite contrasty and don't want to pick up this dust area because that's going to be non-metal so this seems to work just fine so we have this area selected let's just create a new layer uh, press g on the keyboard to get uh, to get this fill tool you'll have the gradient we want the paint bucket tool and let's select the white color and just click and now let's create a new layer deselect everything here and just fill the bottom layer with full black and let's let's merge these two all right um we want to tweak this a bit right now it's uh, there's a lot of soft transitions which you don't really want and not everything is covered as you can see here 
So let's just add the levels here and bring the whiteness all, well, not all the way up, but quite high. And we want a pretty contrasty image. We don't really want too many in between values, so it's either zero or one. It's fine to have some values that are in between, uh, but we want to tweak it so it looks quite contrasty. This should work fine. All right, so let's just merge these two again. Now, we want all of this uh, manhole area to be white and all the parts that are non-metallic to be black. Now, as you can see here along the, well, outside of the manhole, <clears throat> some of these values have turned to white as well, which means that they would display as metal as us as a designer if we were to leave them like this. So we have to just select this manhole and uh, all of the rest will be black. Um, we might be able to get away since this is a pretty much a perfect circle. We might be able to get away with just a circle selection tool, so let's try this. I'm holding Shift and Alt to create a perf uh, perfect circle that drags from the middle of where you clicked. So let's do something that's approximately the size of this. Seems to be about right. So if you hold down W, you can just move the selection around. And just move it until it matches the uh, manhole. I'm going to disable the snap because I don't want it snapping. Okay. All right, seems to be good. Let's just inverse the, the selection. And now we can just paint it. It's not what I wanted. We can just uh, press the B button on the keyboard to get the brush up. We have black selected here. And let's just let's get the hard brush. Just paint everything out. All right, and this is our metalness mask. Let's save this uh, PSD file. Because we don't want to redo the whole work again. I'll save it in the big folder. So decal bake underscore let's call it masks. And let's save it as a PSD file. All right, so let's just call it metalness. We can hide this layer. Um, <clears throat> so now what we want, let's actually first create another layer here which will go fully black again. This is just so it makes it easy for when we paint the, uh, the opacity mask. So we see what the background is and we see what we're painting out. So let's go back to this layer, add a mask. And let's start painting it out. Let's select the brush. I remember this one working pretty well, but let's try it first. Yeah, I think this one might work better. Let's just, you can go quite, um, quite rough on it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just need to have the, the differentiation between what's opaque and what isn't. And the reason I'm doing it with a mask is because I press X on the keyboard, which inverts these colors here. And it's easy for me to undo something if I mess something up. So I highly recommend this workflow because it's non-destructive non and allows you to easily paint this one out. Just invert it here again. You can um, tweak this mask, this mask as much as you want, really. Um, ultimately, it doesn't, like I said, have to be perfect in this case. Uh, the transition is quite rough anyway between the actual dirt and the rocks. So you can go quite, uh, quite heavy on the brush. Just 
Just make sure you're not painting out the actual, actual manhole. Like I just did there. All right. This one's good enough to get us started. Let's get the hard brush again and just paint everything out. All right. So if you go into this view, you see um, to see the mask because if you just click uh, if you just click it, it basically just selects the mask. But if you want to see the map uh, the mask displayed, you just have to hold Alt and click on the mask layer, and we'll get the mask. Just select everything with Control A, Control Copy, well Control C, and paste it. And now we have our opacity map as well. Let's just call this opacity. Save our file. And we don't need to save these as a diff file, so we'll just select go into image mode and set it to eight bits per channel, so we can save it in more types of uh, types of file formats. And let's save this as a TJ file, and let's call this capacity. Uh, just like twenty four bits per pixel in this case. Now we want the metalness as well. Save this also as a TGA file. And let's call it. All right. And I think we're done with Photoshop for now. Close it up. And now we can jump into Substance Designer. Um, I assume you have some basic knowledge of Substance Designer, so, but I will still explain um, most of the nodes that I'm using and what I'm doing, but I won't go over very basic things like the interface and uh, stuff like that. So let's just create a new file. Uh, PBR metallic roughness is fine. You can leave this everything at default. Let's click OK. All right, so now it's time for us to bring all of these files in. So let's bring the base color, the height map, the metalness mask, I won't bring the normal in, and I'll show you why. The occlusion and the opacity mask. Just drag all of them in here. And you want to link resources. Okay. This will link them from the relative position of your, um, of your substance file. And it's usually a good idea to just link them um, <clears throat> because then you won't basically duplicate them in another folder. That's what Substance does when you import the resources. It creates a resources folder where it puts all of those resources. But there's no point because we'll organize them in a similar way. So we're saving on base. So let's set the, um, what is this? The opacity mask, let's set it to grayscale. This one's colored, that's good. The height map, we also want to grayscale. The metal, the metalness mask, also grayscale. And the ambient occlusion. Update it a bit. So let's connect everything to where it's supposed to be right now. So put the base color into the base color. And we can change the scene from this rounded cube to a plane. It'll be easier to just see everything that we're doing. Now, you'll notice that we don't actually have an opacity output, and that's fine. We'll just have to create it ourselves. So just press tab or spacebar. Both of them work. And just search for output and add item here and select opacity and we also want to name it properly so this is the identifier which let's say op the identifier is basically what you'll see displayed here so what's going to be exported as a as a suffix and the label is opacity that's what will be displayed here in the in the viewport let's connect this to the opacity as well now you'll see that there are no changes here in the viewport. That's because we haven't actually told it to use this opacity mask in the viewport, but we can do that right now. So right click on it, view in 3D view, and view it as opacity. And now you'll see we have the opacity mask as well. And this is why I didn't actually bring in the uh, normal map uh, as well. 
Uh, this works very well when we have just surfaces, so um, materials that we want to create that we've usually baked on on a flat plane. It won't work for um, for three D objects that we that we are wrapped. But let's put into uh, the height map into the normal, and you'll see it created already. This is obviously very weak, but we can set it. Um, let's say ten. This already looks well. The, the nice thing about this is that you can adjust the intensity of the normal map as much as you want. But let's leave it at 10 for now. And we'll also plug this into the height map. Like this. All right, and this is the metallic map. Let's just put it into the metal list. And you can see it turns metallic. And now we also want to plug in the ambient occlusion to the appropriate. All right. And now I've noticed that we've actually painted out too much in the opacity in the opacity map, which is not what we want. We want to keep these um, this row of cobblestone here as well, uh, because it will give it a more unique look and it'll fit a lot better. So let's fix that there. Let's do this. And this is why the mask uh, workflow works so well. We can just go back and paint out the um, cobblestone. You can go quite rough right now in the beginning. It's fine. And we can fix it a bit later. So again, let's just fix. There's some issues here that we're so let's just copy this outside. We have our last mask again. Let's save this. Need to change the mode. It's fine. So you'll see the mask already updated in Substance Designer. And you'll see that only where we have messed out the metal parts is what shows up as metal. So that's what we want. Um, okay, so now it's time to do a bit of delighting here. Um, what will the, the first type of delighting will, that we'll be doing is just taking out the ambient occlusion. So Substance Designer has a very good note for that. It's called AO cancellation. So just search for it, and we connect the base color here, and then the AO map that we baked out in here, and you'll see it's already delighted. And this is pretty much a perfect base color. I think it's a bit too much, so let's set it down to 0 0.2. Maybe let's try 0.15. This is good. So you can see it makes quite a big, uh, quite a big difference here. So let's just connect this back. And let's just drag these over a bit so we can have more space to work with. Now, obviously, we're missing the uh, the roughness map. So we'll create this by turning the base color into a grayscale. So let's just set a grayscale conversion. And this makes... This is something that... Um, you might encounter when you're doing this sort of thing. So you'll see that right now the dirt is uh, is going to show up as shinier than the actual stones, which is obviously not correct. So we can plug it in as we have it right now. And you'll see that the dirt just looks completely off. Uh, what we can try do, uh, to do here is just invert it.
and this already looks a lot better but you'll see that because the dirt varies in color you won't always get the desired result everywhere it seems to work most of the time but not always so what we can do is just blend this the AO. And if we set it to, I think it was divide. Uh, you can, the thing with this is you have to experiment a bit with the blending modes. So in this case, divide uh, seems to not be working, but we can also try inverting these two inputs. So the way you invert them easily is just select both of them in the viewport and press X on the keyboard. And you can see that now um, it's working. We're getting the results that we want to get. And before, doing this actually let's just plug it in and see how it looks so you can see that there's a lot more um contrast right now between the actual stones and the dirt which is exactly what we want but i think we can increase the roughness of the dirt a bit more so let's just grab the levels in here so what we want is these uh, the dirt parts to be a bit whiter i think they're still a bit too shiny right now and we want the stones to be a lot darker, so let's just do this. And this gives us a nice result. Okay. So now we have the roughness. Let's just drag everything to. Okay, so there's a few, well, there's two more things that we need to fix for this one. Uh, one, you'll notice that the actual color of the metal is not really PBR correct. And we'll fix that with the metalness mask. And also the, um, the actual manhole is not shiny enough. It looks almost dirty, which is, again, not something that we want. So let's, let's fix the, the roughness first. Let's get in another blend node. Plug this in here. And I think what we can do is just blend it with a uniform black color, set it to grayscale, based on this mask, which is the metalless mask. So if we set this to multiply, again, let's try inverting these inputs. You will see that if we plug it in now, it's obviously way too shiny. But we can just fix it with the opacity slider here until we get something that looks a bit more natural. And this seems to maybe even all right. Uh, what I like to do with these um, smaller nodes, so to speak. Um, is I'd just like to dock them to this input. What the docking does is, you'll see, if you just press D on the keyboard while you have this node selected, it basically docks it right here. So it's uh, it's basically just for organizational purposes. Um, it doesn't really change anything. You can undock it. You can undock it again by pressing D. Uh, it just makes the graph a lot cleaner and it's easy to know because it says what it is here. So. This is just to make the graph easier to navigate. Um, the only thing that's left to fix now is the actual color of the metal. So if you search for PBR, um, you will have base color metallic roughness here. Actually, no, this is not the dope. Not that we want. I think this is yes this is not everyone so it's if you search for pbr it's metal reflectance and we can choose the physically accurate color that we of the metal that we want here so in this case it's gold by default but we don't have, we want gold i think this is most likely iron so let's just choose this so this would be the physically accurate color of iron so let's blend this base color that we have here with the color of iron and of course we only want it to be where there's actual metal here so let's just use this mask 
and now we have the correct color here um it looks a bit weird i know but um we can also just tweak it a bit although i wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless you manage to keep the same value um it will look good in the engine uh, and although it might look a bit weird in substance designer which is fine uh we we only care about how it looks in engine not in substance designer um so we'll uh, we'll tweak all of these in a bit more detail when we get to unreal um but for now because i've already done some experiments beforehand uh, this actually works very well in unreal and you won't see you won't see displaying this uh uh this weird shade of color and we can just uh, i like to use uh tomoko this is the hdri that i like to use to just properly preview all of my uh all of my values and looking at it now i think the stones could stand to be a bit a bit more a bit more reflective let's go back to our levels here tweak this a bit more We also need to tweak this blend again because right now uh because we've adjusted the values before that makes it a bit too shiny so let's just drag this down. Yeah. all right and this is pretty much it for this asset as you can see once you have all of the maps that you need it's in this case it was quite easy to just get everything to where you wanted it to so we have all of our base color the normal map the roughness uh the metalness map ao height and the opacity um this is pretty much done in terms of actually tweaking it uh in terms of getting the proper values out of it uh i do we do we do need to do another thing first so for um for our shader setup, we'll be using, um, we'll be packing our ambient occlusion, roughness, metalness, and the height map into one single texture. And we'll call that one, we'll bring in another output, and we'll call it ARM. So ambient occlusion, roughness, metalness, that's what this means, ARM here. Um, and the reason why Substance Designer makes these things so much easier is because you have so much flexibility so for example we just need to bring in a node just to plug all of the maps into it and it's called an rgba merge basically this node offers you inputs for the red channel the green channel blue and alpha and just merges all of these into one single texture which will plug into the area so now it's just a matter of plugging the correct textures in their proper inputs so since we're using like i mentioned arm We'll plug in the ambient occlusion, the roughness, the metalness, and the height. And this is the ARM texture. It's basically ARMH, but ARM is enough to describe it. Um, always bake your, and this is very important always bake your height maps for all of the for all of the scans that you will be processing that's because we'll be using that height map for um we has our lighting later on in a reel um, and it's essential to the workflow that we'll be using for this particular project so always bake out the height map and one more thing before we export everything i like to keep it organized in a certain way so we'll go if we select this output which is the base color um the identifier is called C. What we want to call it is BCO. That's base color opacity. And we'll actually add the opacity now. So we just need to bring in an alpha merge. So this will just merge the alpha with the base color. So which is where we'll put our opacity map. So put in the base color here. And where it says A for alpha, just plug in the opacity map. 
and plug this again into the base card now. And you can uh, you can preview the transparency here if you just click this. It says show checkerboard. You click it, you can see the opacity here. Let's just unclick it because we don't need it right now. So this is BCO and the label card can stay like that because we are only interested in what it says here. Norm, um, another thing you need to do for the group. So the group, you will see the group that something belongs to, that an output belongs to when you export it. So let's just see how it looks like. If you go to this tools, export outputs, you will see here one, one group is called default. That's the two extra nodes, the two extra output nodes that we've added. Uh, it just gives it a default group uh, when you create them and the material. So what we want is because we, we want it to be very easy for us to select the, the things that we want to export because we want to export, for example, the roughness, the metal, the metalness, the AO, etc. as separate maps since we're already merging them into this one single texture. So we want to create a group for everything that we'll export called export. The normal map, we'll call it N. And again, the group will be export. The roughness, we can call it R just to keep it consistent. But the group will just be viewport, meaning we just want to see this in, in the viewport. It's the same for here. M for metallic, and the group will be viewport. AO for ambient occlusion, and the group will be again viewport. Height is age, group is viewport. Opacity is OP, that's fine. Group will be viewport again. We don't need it. And the ARM is going to be in the export group. So let's save our package. And let's just call it decal underscore manhole underscore over. And make sure to call this is the this is a substance file that contains it, it can contain multiple graphs. And when you export it, it will take the name of the graph. So you need to name this properly as well. So just name it the same as the actual uh, substance file. So decal underscore manhole underscore 01. Save it. So now when we export, you can see the groups that we create. So viewport, we don't need any of this. We can even close it out. We just need the export. So let's go into, let's create a folder here called export. Select the folder. And this is perfectly fine. Now, what we need to do, you'll see here the preview of the name. So it'll be decal underscore manhole underscore one underscore BCO. Uh, I use text for textures. You can use just D underscore. Um, it's important to just keep it consistent. So whatever you decide to choose, uh, either text or T underscore, that's perfectly fine. But make sure to keep all of it, uh, all of it consistent. So I'll go with text in my case. And we don't want to export it as a TIFF. We want a TG file. So let's export the outputs. So we have this export file here, uh, folder. And these are all of our exports that we just created. So these are ready to be brought in engine, but we're not there yet. Uh, I just wanted to show you what the process is to create uh, this certain, the specific asset from, um, from all, all the way from scanning to the final settings in, um, in Substance Designer. Uh, we'll do another one that is a 3D asset, and I'll show you how to process that one. And we're going a bit, uh, uh, a bit more quickly over these, simply because I want you to be ready to capture scans and process them as quickly as possible. Starting next week, we'll go into the blockout phase. So there's there's not going to be any scan processing in that phase. I'll just show you how to do the blockouts, what the requirements are, how to set it up for uh, for a modular workflow. We'll uh, we'll set up the project and some basic shaders in Unreal, etc. Um, but before you do that, it's good to actually start just building out the library and knowing what the whole process involves.
Hey there, now remember, like and subscribe for more of these videos. I hope you enjoyed, and make sure to share this video with a friend, because I don't know how long I'm gonna keep this up. It is part of a class, but I'm gonna leave it up for a while to make sure that, you know, as many people as possible have exposure to this, to start to see, you know, if this is something they wanna try to figure out on their own. All right, see ya.